You know, sometimes I can hardly believe I get to call this a job, right? I guess the only thing that reminds me it's a job is, well, I can't just make everybody pay for my dreams and keep them in the end. So a lot of times I get all romantic towards the end of the job and I'm like, oh man, I wish I could keep that. But in this case, oh man, I want to keep this truck. I mean, realistically, who wouldn't, right? I mean, if you love classic transportation design, but you yearn for enhanced functionality, why would you look any further? And the really good thing about this particular project is we built it for a client that we've done several projects for, and he just gets it, you know what I mean? Like, okay, fine, people get what we do often, not always, but he gets it on such a deep level that he's able to make the commitment to allow me to geek out and not cut corners and not make sacrifices and not stop it good enough to take a build this far. You know, at the risk of sounding cocky, I don't think anyone has taken this model this far before, period. So, gosh, I don't even know where to start. Let's start with the basics. So, you probably know we've done a couple Dodge D200 or Power Wagon crew cap builds, and they rock. And they're super rare, they're hard to find. But the Ford version, which by the way, uh, I found in an old uh, sales book that actually came with this truck, they were called the Six Pack, which is kind of cool. So they're really, really stupid rare. And I mean, they, they usually saw super harsh duty. So most of them have rusted away or been bashed to hell and no longer exist. So they were generally built for like municipalities, for railroad companies, for water and power divisions, or for the military. So really excited to build one of these, you know. Uh, it's always been one of my favorite trucks. In fact, my daily driver was the lowly standard three-quarter ton long bed version of this truck for over 10 years. I love that truck. It's just, there's a certain grace to the design of these trucks, like this detail on the belt line where the window meets the belt line shape of the main door. And there's like totally unnecessary contours here and there. And the front fender, the grace of that front fender and the relevance in the rear quarter panel, which by the way, you'll see the relevance to the Broncos, so it was, and even the Falcons. So, I mean, there was kind of a continuity with other Ford products in the 60s, but it just works so well on this truck. And while I like later Ford pickups, like the 67s and up, they just cannot hold a candle to the design of these. And then as a design geek and a detail guy, the interior of these, they're solid, there's a lot more metal. The later ones just year by year, more plastic, more plastic, more plastic, but the basic design language of these is so pure that it was a perfect candidate for me to geek out on. So that's why we're here. So let's see, we took this 65 crew cab truck and we started the discussion with the client. Now, he specifically wanted this model Although he was open to doing a Dodge, I'm like, eh, I don't want to repeat. I like to keep doing different stuff. God forbid we find efficiencies in the derelict or reformer program by doing the same thing twice, right? Who can imagine? But we found the truck and we started talking about mechanical. So going into the project, we knew we wanted to do four-wheel drive. We knew we wanted diesel. And the knee-jerk reaction was, okay, why don't we do uh, modern Ford content like with a power stroke? But the client said, you know what? I don't know. I'm not in love with the modern Ford trucks. And you know, it's a similar story to the Dodges we did before where the client said, you know what? I." love my 3500 Dodge, but I'm not in love with the trim and the plastics, but the powertrain is kick-ass and it lasts forever. And furthermore, Rockstar Gale Banks with Banks Power has tons of capability manipulating and enhancing the powertrain. So 
even though it seems weird and I know you Ford guys are gonna yell at me, the client said he wants us to build it on the Dodge platform. I'm down with that. We had experience with it. We all love it. It's pretty straightforward. So what we did is we went and sourced a really nice low mileage, all original 2006 3500 Dodge Mega Cab. So 5.9 genius motor, just electronic enough to be refined, give you good efficiency, great longevity, but not so mechanically complicated, mostly on the electronic side to create a huge pain in the ass to outfit in its non-native platform or to enhance and get more performance out of it. So that's what we did. We took that modern Dodge, we modified the wheelbase, and we enhanced it with Gail Banks's six-gun system and the Banks stainless steel exhaust. Otherwise, we left all mechanical systems dead stock. Now, it was a truck that was, you know, what? 11 years old so there were some cosmetic things and some maintenance things that we addressed but nothing massive we did take the liberty of milling off dodge off the valve cover so it matched a little bit better um, exhaust is now ceramic coated stainless uh, performance is about probably 650 700 foot pounds of torque so it's not the thousand horsepower monster that we built before but it certainly gets the job done <laughs> And you know what's nice is with all of Banks' stuff, it's not like built to the last degree of viable. So you don't have a huge stupid smokestack barfing stuff all over everybody. You still have reliability and refinement and how it drives, but it just has tons of torque and is fun, fun, fun. So then we use the core chase truck uh, off-road suspension system, which we've used before and just love. We modified the rear leaf pack a little bit to get the stance and clearance right. And then on the exterior body, as with the Dodge trucks you remember, we completely disassembled the body, pre-fitted on the modern chassis by altering the chassis body mounts, not by altering the cabin. And then we media blasted it to raw metal so we could work really hard to refine the gaps. Let's face it, these trucks when new, no one cared. No one was looking at them as hard as we are looking at them. So, ridiculous amount of time and money spent on massaging the gaps and panel fitment and alignments. The front fenders were heavily modified because I don't like repositioning a motor, especially one as heavy as this big boy diesel, in relationship to the center point of the front axle. You're gonna get all sorts of surprises in chassis dynamics and steering. I want nothing to do with that. So we modified the arch line of the front fender. So while we were doing that, we said, well, hmm, if we're gonna do that, Let's talk about refining that line. Let's make the height of it and the sweep of it kind of have more relevance to the rear fender. So I'm happy with that. And I'd like to think if I didn't tell you about it, you would not have known we did that. Uh, colors, I just love these colors. So what's cool about it, which I don't know if it's gonna pick up in the video, but like certain lights, certain angles, there's a massive shift in the way it looks. So it's super, super cool. Like from some angles, it looks like it's one paint color. From other angles, you distinctly see the difference in the tone. So we made these colors up. I didn't steal them from anything this time. And when we did it, we decided to use the same clear and the same nanoparticle particles of mica but different color pigments. So that kept them very closely related and I think has a lot to do with um, that, that kind of effect of looking single color, dual color, depending on light and angle. You'll notice the belt line trim down the cab and bed. The higher trim package of the original single cab trucks were available with that. It was called the custom cab. So the custom cab package came with sexier gauges, a padded dash, door panel pockets down low, cooler door panel, upholstered inserts, and that cool belt line trim. I took some of those elements, but not all of them into my final design. So like I didn't pad the dash because to me aesthetically it didn't like continue into the door. So it kind of made no sense. But the gauges on the custom cab are kick ass. So that was the foundation for these gauges. The belt line trim, while it was cool, it was kind of faux. 
So I basically just took a mic to it and took inspiration from it. And then we CNC'd that in-house. And then it's a billet aluminum. And then I think it's 60, 61 alloy. And then we had uh, the demast or engine turned insert, which again on the original was kind of faked. On this, it's laser cut stainless and it works out really well. What a brain drainer to get that done. The other thing we realized is if you did a sideline look of it and you align it, that's one thing. But then if you looked at it from 90 degrees, that looked all wrong. So we went for a side view and aligned that and studied many original trucks to make sure it wasn't something we screwed up on the bodywork. On the outside, you know, we subtly tucked the front bumper in a little bit. We took a bumper from another application and modified it and built braces to put that in the rear so it looks stock. But I do believe this truck stock had no rear bumper whatsoever. So that's, I like it, adds a little utility. In the front, we left the grill dead stock and then we took the FORD letters and turned it into ICON, my bad. We also took an opportunity to brand it ICON right in front of the A pillars in that short belt line trim piece before the spear continues up onto the hood. We used our ICON BR rear view mirrors. We studied some bigger designs, but in the end, these work great, so we ran them. All the rest of the stock exterior trim is pretty much stock. I mean, the hood ornament is not stock. It's kind of sort of stock. We laser scanned the original one, recreated that STL file as true surfaces in CAD, and then just monkeyed with it and redesigned it a little bit, and then created the round section in the middle with a proud shoulder that allowed us to take the Icon Lizard and put it in there. So all of that trim, stock and Icon developed, was all nickel plated and brushed. Glass has a very mild tint to it. Otherwise, it's just glass, so I guess that's pretty straightforward. This guy's in a hurry, so I'm gonna let him go by. Um, door handles, they're just gorgeous, so we left those stock and just enhanced the tint. All new weather stripping, all new door hinge pins, all new glass, all new whiskers, all new door rubbers, blah, blah, blah. Headliner, we used a material that would have been appropriate in a Ford of this vintage, but that was not used in the crew cab trucks, nor the standard cabs, I believe. So it's actually a replica of the old Mustang. It's kind of like the moon crater, pretty simple. I wanted this to be like redesigned, but subtly bespoke, like could have been from that day, but like the boss's truck. So like if they had a fleet of standard cab pickups on the working ranch, when the boss showed up, this is what he'd be rocking. Steering wheel, again, stock, slightly modified with the Icon Lizard and surface plating. And then it kind of felt too spindly, so we went ahead and leather wrapped it. Dash and gauges. Tried to be really honest and true to the original design. The layout is kind of sort of stock. As mentioned, the gauge cluster, the housing at least, and the design inspiration came from the original crew cap. Then we worked with our buddy Shannon at Redline to very subtly modify it, but make it so it could communicate with a CAN bus electrical network that the engine is operating on. So we have full instrumentation for 4x4 brake, check engine, temp, oil, fuel, and alternator. Um, we monkeyed with the fonts to be correct for the era. Um, and then we took that damask or engine turned laser cut thin gauge stainless and that's an overlay over the stock piece. Next, the stock knobs are super cool and they have these nifty escutcheons that indicate the functionality of everything. But the problem was there wasn't much design continuity between the two of them. So what I did was we laser scanned our favorite of all of them and then we lasered the bezels. We modified those to fit comply with the modern switches that we like to use that are easy to source and really reliable. And then we executed those all in aluminum and then again nickel plated and brushed them. There were a couple added knobs needed for the modern donor vehicles functionality. So you'll notice the overdrive switch. So you can manually, as in the original modern truck, turn on and off your overdrive. 
and then also the uh, bed light switch so the bed light switch is kind of cool i don't know maybe they're doing it now but i have yet to see a modern truck that had this stupid simple functionality of when you drop your tailgate lighting so not that cheesy cab light up top that just casts hard shadows but there's an opportunity under the rails inside of the bed to do full length led lighting so you can't see it but it illuminates everything perfectly so i don't know maybe someone's done it if they have won't be the first idea i thought was my own but anyway we did that so it also has a switch on the tailgate so when you drop the tailgate voila your bed lights up for ac of course we worked with vintage air we love those guys killer product we fit their biggest unit in here and then we kind of struggled with the ac vents and to be honest if there's one thing in this truck that i'm not like super excited about my design choices on it's probably the vents um, i like the mesh that helps but the brackets just seem too too stark too simple but I really didn't want to modify the dash itself because it just has this killer sweep, you know, full left to right sweep. Oh, which reminds me, another thing I stole from the custom cab is that trim that divides my two different colors. What a geek. By the way, if I'm geeking out too much, this video is probably more interesting to you played fast forward. At least the pictures are cool, but if you're a geek like me and you'll hang in there, I'll appreciate it because uh, I'm excited. This truck's so cool. So heat vent, AC, defrost, all that rocks, and we're able to hide it. The vents are cool, but not as cool as they probably could have been, but would have taken a ridiculous amount of time and money to sculpt and design them the way I saw. And the funny thing is, I didn't see fit in the beginning. So here I am in the done truck test driving it, second guessing myself. So it's hard to go back to the client and say, hey, let's take the truck apart and geek out on the vents. But in all fairness, I don't think I've ever built anything that at the end there isn't something that irks me, like something that wasn't perfect. But I've talked to a lot of designer friends and it's I'm kind of constantly building prototypes with these one-offs, so it's kind of just par for the course as they say. Column is an I did it, painted to match the body, gives us better functionality than the original, greater safety. So it has the tilt function and it has the collapsible link in the engine bay and two Borgensen joints. So it isolates you from any of the like vibrations created in the chassis. Um, glove box lined in proper materials, metal, not that cardboard felty crap that they did back in the day that always irked me. Uh, slightly under the dash, left and right, those are the switches for the carbon fiber heat blankets that are integrated into the front seats. And in the rear, right behind the C pillars, you can reach back and there's switches for those as well. Seats, let's talk about textiles and materials. So again, super fun. I've recently been playing with high-end architectural suppliers specifically in the outdoor furniture space reason being durability right they're dealing with mold and big temperature variations and uv constant exposure they have really high what they call dry rub ratings which is a test process where they mechanically rub a material against itself and then rate after how many rubs does it start to get balls and kind of go to piss so anything from that world is rated higher than any of the automotive fabrics plus you have more freedom to get into creative stuff so my design focus was to kind of be americana sort of pendleton-esque but like every vintage pendleton i've ever bought i never wear it because it's just so damn itchy and the tactile is a big part of the experience so I wanted to be kind of like that, but not that. I wanted a better touch and feel. So this product comes from my friend Jason at a cool company called Diamond Foam. And he knows everybody in that fancy world. So he helped us source these. And it kind of has that look, but it's super soft and nice. And what I wanted to do was this crazy red interior, but I wanted to be like, ah, red. So we worked through tons of samples to find this red. And again, I don't know if it'll show up on camera, but it's like kind of modded. It, it, it has like a little bit of black and gray going on. It's not just 
a single surface. It has some different effects to it. And I'm happy with that. It came out really good. Carpet. I've been using this Hog Garden Square Weave out of Germany and a lot of stuff lately. And I'm digging it. It's super durable. It has the right look. And we got lucky in that it had a red that wasn't too red again. So then with the leftover hide trimmings from this seat, well, some of them, some of them I stole and took home to make bags and wallets and belts out of because that's my latest geek out hobby. But with the rest of them, we hemmed the carpet uh, in that leather. The mats are removable. Underneath the carpet is the Dyna pad plus a secret sauce aerospace pad. Then on the underside of the body, there's a big heat shield to control the turbo heat temperature. And we reshaped the firewall to allow that clearance. Dynamat everywhere, doors, headliner, back of cap, body polyurea coated on the underside and on the inside before reassembly. And transfer case, we got away from the computer controlled transfer case and went one generation prior Dodge transfer case. So just simple mechanical linkage. I was trying to leave that knob just kind of cool and simple, but I think I'm gonna throw it on our laser and uh, etch in the four by controls because it's kind of not intuitive. And again, I don't want some ugly sticker on the dash. Just can't handle that. Audio system, one we've been using a lot, so it's totally invisible, except for two knobs. One is exciting the Bluetooth signal, and that one also controls the volume. The other one is for the bass circuit volume. This sound system kicks some serious ass, so it's running the higher end focal, or focal, K2 speakers without separates because there really wasn't a good space for them. And then we're running the JL Audio shallow 10 inch bass and then an array of amplifiers. All of that is built into the rear floor under the rear seat so you lost no space. Other than obviously the front speakers were carefully built into the front kicks and the rear speakers we built enclosures that put those just behind the seat but they get enough visibility to the front. Dun, dun, dun. Three point seat belts for everybody. I know someone's gonna say, why aren't they red? It looks stupid. They were too bright red. I couldn't find the right red. So we just kept it simple. Oh, power windows. So we use these uh, new relics power windows a lot. But my ex mechanical engineer, when he first started, he and I were geeking out. Wouldn't it be cool if we could make that? Cause if you have a wide, big car or a four door, you have to be an octopus to do the reach around to get all the windows. But I'm in love with the aesthetic of these old school analog handles, right? Just keeps it old school. So he developed on his own time this killer system. So normal control, lean on it down, it goes down, lean on it up, it goes up. But what's cool now is you do it twice and wow, all your windows go down. You do it twice for up and all your windows go up. So I think that's super cool. And uh, I'm kind of on the fence. I'm thinking about developing that as something that we would commercially distribute and sell. It's kind of not my world. I'm not really that good at it. Don't have the infrastructure for it. So we might just keep it in-house and use it on our stuff. What do you think? I don't know. I'm kind of torn. Two other elements of the interior you will not see in this video is a Banks IQ control panel and a trailer brake electric controller. They both add utility for the client, but they hurt me eyeballs because I worked so hard on the aesthetic, so I yanked them out before we did the video. Other minor changes to the door panels, obviously high in leather, duh. And I redesigned the armrest and I didn't do the pockets down below because ergonomically they kind of suck and they're hard to reach and I've got some electronics in the door. So I just simply did not bother. So blah, blah, blah. I could go on forever about this truck, but I think I've probably covered enough and I'll tag in a little subtitle if I did not. Thank you for your support for my ridiculous brand. Thank you for following us, for supporting us, and thank you for defending me to the trolls. I love that I don't have to do that anymore. That means a lot. Any questions, reach out to us, old school phone, 818-280-3333, website, which I guess is becoming old school, icon4x4.com, Instagram, icon4x4, Facebook, icon4x4, or me, Jonathan Ward, a lot more fun stuff going on there. Be well, have a great day.